All right, I think we are on. Um, hi, all. Uh, welcome to uh, the session of how to B2B a CTO. Um, my name is Apoorv Pandey. I'm a, I'm a partner at Foundation Capital. Um, for all those people who are new to build um, and new to foundation, we are an early stage venture fund. I've uh, been around for 25 plus years uh, and invest primarily in fintech and the enterprise side. Uh, and on the enterprise side, we invest across the stack. Um, just before we get into uh, uh, the discussion today, uh, a quick overview of the format. We'll be talking to Abby and Roy for almost for around 30 minutes, if we can fit in our conversation in 30 minutes. Uh, and then we'll move to a Q&A after that. But if you have any questions, uh, feel free to drop in your questions in the comment section on the right. Um, and I'll pick them along the way. Um, awesome. Uh, Abby, Roy, great to have you. Um, maybe we can start with uh, quick introductions. Uh, um, and if you could uh, cover like uh, your background in terms of your past experiences and the current one, um, and also talk a bit about the size of the organization you manage, uh, that'll be great. Uh, maybe we can start with Abby and, and then move to Roy after that. Well, I am super excited to be here with such a, an esteemed panel. Perva, you and I go way back, and Roy, it's been so nice to meet you through this process. Uh, so I am CTO at Puppet. I've been here for a couple of years. I um, also run product design and engineering, so I have a team of about 175 fantastic individuals. Prior to joining Puppet, I was the CEO of Cloud Foundry Foundation, and I have been in technology a little over two decades. And I am one of those weird people that have spent my entire career in enterprise infrastructure. <laughs> and it's uh, kind of my jam and I really love the space, but I also love um, B2B and that's, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity and room for growth and a lot of interesting, uh, interesting evolution and innovation happening in this space. Thanks Abby. And, and just to add to that, like were you one of the few people who spent like so much time in infrastructure and also on the open source side. So we will dig into both uh, in the conversation. Roy, I would love to get your background as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and super jealous of of Abby's uh, you know passion and capabilities in the open source world. I've done a few stints of trying to open source projects and and have failed. So I hope to learn a little bit from her here. Um, for myself. Uh, born and raised uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, native, still here, um, and have been super lucky in my career to, uh, you know, find my passion right out of the gate, which is software development, software development process, um, and land in a few very high growth areas. It's uh, in the Atlanta market, you know, it's a, it's a burgeoning community, but uh, from, from, Way back when I started, uh, it, it was more difficult to find those software organizations that were in that high growth stage. And early on, uh, landed at the Weather Channel, uh, wore just about every hat there from uh, lead developer to M&A uh, uh, acquisitions. Um, and then right as smartphones became feature phones, I took the uh, responsibility for building out our mobile development group. And, uh, one of my proudest achievements is when we started there, the business and the product team wanted to outsource everything um, because the experts in the industry were not internal to us. And so starting from ground zero, building a team of 50 plus, uh, by the time we were worldwide scale, no product manager or business person wanted to work with anyone but our team. Uh, and, you know, it's just super exciting experience. Uh, I went from there to a company called ShareCare, um, again, happened to stumble on the, the high growth startup in Atlanta at that point in time, eight years ago, no, 10 years ago now, uh, 65 person company. Uh, my engineering team went from two to over 300 over the course of eight years. Um, started out with just, just a small footprint here in Atlanta and expanded to 40 states and 10 countries. Um, you know, and then you know, for whatever whatever rabbit's foot I carry around, uh, I got introduced to Tope and Calendly, and I never thought I would leave the place that I was in with ShareCare uh, to join some small scheduling startup. Um, but Tope's vision for what we do and our focus on our users and 
establishing the easiest way for two people to get together and collaborate on any given topic and removing that friction, um, we're social creatures. And Calendly solves that problem for millions of people. Uh, and so, yeah, so I've been here for about two and a half years. Uh, the team when I started was just a, a handful of engineers uh, and a few QA people, about a team of 20. Uh, we're over 100 now uh, and have developed those additional disciplines of uh, infrastructure, architecture, uh, project management. I don't own product. I have a, an amazing partner in, in Annie as our chief product officer. She comes from Glassdoor to join us uh, to help us establish that vision and, and path forward. Um, but uh, but the rest of the technology organization was up to me. Thanks, Roy. That was that was really awesome. And uh, I was going to say, Calendly is no longer a, a small startup. Uh, it's 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 grown significantly. Um, significantly. Uh, and and between uh, Abby and Roy, both of you have uh, like worked across different phases. You've grown teams from nothing to to hundred two hundred plus uh, people organizations uh, and even more. Um, uh, and given that uh, the intersection of that with what's happening today in the market, where because of pa the pandemic, uh, the work has gone uh, completely remote, and in some cases it's coming back to be hybrid, but it's predominantly remote today. One of the questions that's running in the minds of a lot of founders is how do you build um, and manage a high-performing team? And if I have to like further bifurcate or, or kind of break down that question into like its its sub parts, one of the part questions is how do you attract talent in this market? That's kind of the first core question. Uh, knowing that like the market is doing well, there's so many Fang and and pre-Fang and and public companies that are hiring uh, a lot of uh, talent. Uh, what's the best way? to attract talent uh, to your early stage, seed stage, series A stage, series B stage company. Um, um, maybe we can start with Roy, like what are your thoughts? And Abby would love to get your thoughts as well. Uh, I'll start out with it is a, it's a brave new world with attracting talent right now. Um, you know, I'd say it's the hottest topic in our industry. You, you don't see, you don't go a day without seeing the great resignation articles um, you know, everyone's gone to remote first, so it opens up this whole new world of any person has an opportunity with just about any company. Um, we've been shelter in place for 18 plus months, so there's this pent up energy of, of wanting change, wanting to try something new. So even when you land someone, how do you keep them? Um, you know, and inflation is real. Uh, the market is real. There's a lot of venture capital money. Uh, many startups blooming out there that all have great stories. Um, so, so how do you differentiate, differentiate yourself? Um, you know, and it, it sounds like a really difficult problem, but in my experience, it really boils down to two things. Yeah. Your team, your engineers, they want to have impact. They really want to, they want to build software that, that changes something, that does something for the world, whether it's the users or the open source mm -hmm. community, they want to have impact in what they build and they want to learn. Uh, you know, they want to grow skills. They want to be in a place that cultivates that. And so, you know, for any given organization, what are those unique characteristics that you bring? What is the impact that you allow your individuals to have? How do you provide autonomy? How do you set uh, proper uh, expectations on what, outcomes you're driving toward uh, and then make room for that innovation and impact for those for those individuals that will ultimately be the success of your company. That's awesome. And those are definitely some of the important pillars. I'll come back to you is how you're implementing those those pillars uh, in your day to day. Uh, Abby, what are your thoughts um, in attracting kind of the right people for your organization at that stage? Yeah, I, I would just echo what Roy said. I mean, impact. Every Everybody wants to feel like that they're really driving immense value to an organization rather than being another player on the team. And the opportunity smaller startups have is you can really, you know, in early stage startups, that early team matters. Everybody's job matters. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot uh, of value in telling that story about how your, your, your impact is going to matter day one. And here's what that looks like. And here's our mission, mission and here's our vision for the future. And here's where we're going to go. And you're going to be part of that. And I mm -hmm. think really 
storytelling is so key to bringing, attracting and retaining talent is mm -hmm. what is my, where are we going and what's my role in that? Mm -hmm. And then now as your team gets bigger and bigger, it's that gets more and more complex to, to, yeah. to, to say those things and for people to understand that because, you know, the challenge I have in my organization is with, you know, is you're constantly reminding people of their role and their impact because it's easy to for people to feel left out or to feel like mm -hmm. they're the thing that they're working on is not the most important thing. And so it's really something that I work on a lot is really reconnecting the dots. Why mm -hmm. what you're working on matters and how does that connect with the the larger vision and the the, the mission of the company. But you know, today, you know, we're you know we're being hit by the same problems everybody else is, which is attracting talent and then also you know, Roy, as you pointed out, the, the attrition is creeping up. And so for me, it's about, okay, how do we make everyone feel not only included, but really a core part of where we're trying to go? And that's, that's, a, that's the ongoing challenge. Absolutely. And I think you, you both of you mentioned this, right? Like storytelling is obviously key and in, in order to attract those people. Uh, but Abby, you also alluded to the fact that you need to reconnect the dots and and provide that. So when, when I, if I like uh, double click on that, if you think of one is visibility, like um, am I uh, getting what I was promised when I was thinking of joining? Uh, that's the visibility piece of it. Second is actionability. Like if I'm performing the way I need to perform, will I actually grow? Uh, and will I actually get more ownership? Will I actually make more impact? Uh, how, how are you kind of managing that and from an execution uh, point of view day to day? Um, um, at Puppet or what you're seeing with some of the companies that you're advising? Maybe we can start with Abby this time and love to get Roy's thoughts as well. At the earlier stage company, that's easier. Yep. It's easier to show impact. It's easier to show the connective tissue. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to have that one-on-one -on -one time with people to talk about career growth and opportunity. And early stage, there's a lot of opportunity. There is yep. no shortage of things you can be part of. You know, as the organization scales, I would say one of our biggest challenge over the last year has been really being clear about that. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly as we hire a, a lot of um, emerging talent, so people that are early in their career um, that don't understand career progression. I think specifically in my head, specific of engineering, being very clear on what the difference between an associate level engineer and moving up from there. What does the career progression look like? And that's something we had to really spend time on this year, which is writing that down. It's not mm -hmm. just enough for people to know it, um, but really articulating what are those goals and what are those skill sets you need to have to progress in your career and being very transparent about that. So people can have that self-driven, you know, visibility into what their career progression should look like at this company. Mm -hmm. Because Oftentimes, in many engineering organizations, you revert to that, well, you've been in the job a year, have you been in the job two years? And that isn't good enough anymore. It's more mm -hmm. of like, what's the skills you need to have to progress? And are we helping you do that? And, and that was something we really had to, to, to kind of dig deep on. It's like, okay, let's, let's really write this down so that yep. everyone, you know, if you're fresh out of college, you want to be able to say, I want to know what skills I need to have to move forward so that I can mm -hmm. work on those things. Yep, yep, and and those are kind of the hard things to do, right? Because uh, it's you need to clearly define um, what those like day to day challenges are, those uh, that that role looks like, and then what the progression means to the next role, um, and living up to that too. Um, Roy, Roy, what has been your experience? I, I I think that was very well said. I, maybe I would dig into that just a little bit more and say it's it's the what. Mm -hmm. Um, because as engineers, we always we we want a set of check boxes. Give me the boxes, and I'll get to the next level. Mm -hmm. And but it's also the how, mm -hmm. uh, and especially as um, as you're hiring a, a, a larger organization, um, understanding that not everybody will be on that same level, and and how are you lifting each other up and providing education opportunities for each other, and mm -hmm. and um, uh, creating impact through others mm -hmm. um, rather than, you know, in, in that very early stage, everyone's the generalist and, yep. and it's very clear. I delivered this and it went out. And as you continue to grow and specialize, you know, how do you, how do you pull the passions out of the, uh, out of the team and really start to let them 
go deeper in areas and, and lift each other up and provide those education opportunities. And I think that's how you can kind of continue to, to, to convey that impact and set expectations on, on growth. Really, really cool. Uh, another aspect of like um, at least managing your team besides like bringing them on board and defining all those basic principles around which define their their progression and growth within the organization is also uh, understanding productivity, understanding and engaging those people, especially in the remote first world, knowing that who is motivated, who's not, who's uh, getting too much work, uh, but doesn't have the visibility around that. Um, what's what's been your uh, approach to to manage that that aspect for your organization um R roy what are your thoughts well uh it, it, you know i think it, it starts with um why are we doing what we're doing mm -hmm. um and what are the outcomes that we're we're expecting um so you know it's not good enough to to list a set of deliverables right you can't deliver this document or deliver this feature. Mm -hmm. It is, how is that feature um, going to change the business? Mm -hmm. And so as, as a leader in a remote first world, your, you know, your first and foremost goal is to, to establish what that success criteria looks like and, and make it measurable. Mm -hmm. um, not just the checkbox of, did I, did I get this done? And uh, you know, so uh, you know, if I lean on an OKR framework, you know, your key result being something that you can you can start at the highest top level company objective, right? And then begin to break that down for each individual and show how they fit in mm -hmm. in, in the system and, and what metrics they're really looking to move in order to establish the, those performance goals. Um, you know, it's it's always easy as a uh, you know, as a data driven organization to, to want to say like, just let's look at the numbers, you know, and, and determine how successful someone is. Um, but that is, uh, you know, that's fraught with, with, with is problematic on so many fronts. And so, uh, if you can first drive those outcomes, uh, through your, through your measurable key results, but then secondarily have a, a, a management organization that is really engaged uh, with the how and the values of the company and, and getting those things done. then for us, that's been our recipe in the remote first world to, to really, uh, keep everyone highly engaged and productive in the organization. Uh, one double, one follow-up question for you, uh, before I, I take Abby's thoughts on that, uh, are there any products and tools that you use, uh, to, to manage, um, uh, excitement levels, productivity levels, uh, in your organization today? Uh, yeah, uh, so, so we, you know, we're, uh, especially for engagement, you know, we use Glint to, to send out engagement surveys and get feedback, mm -hmm. uh, creating that conversation in the feedback, uh, uh, loop in a, in a remote first world is so essential. Mm -hmm. Um, but then also taking that feedback and, and putting it back out in front of the organization and saying, this is what we heard. Mm -hmm. And this is how we're going to react to it. And this is our action plan based on that. Uh, and Glint so far has been a, been a pretty useful utility for us to, to do that. Got it. Super helpful. Uh, Abby, how are you managing it uh, on the puppet front? I, th I feel like it's uh, Roy hit on something that I actually want to double click on because I do think Roy outlined it really great with being clear about outcomes. But the engage. <laughs> Um, not to pick on you, Rob, but I do think we could we could do a whole panel on this one, which is getting engagement <laughs> from that mid level. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. like that. You got you you kind of glossed over, but that's actually the hardest thing. Setting an OKR is easy. Yeah, yeah. But democratizing and pushing that accountability down is, is I will say, it, it's been our biggest challenge, which is mm -hmm. really you know because I'm a big believer in transparency, but also democratization of in, a, in ownership of out, you know, your own path and, you know, really kind of owning and, and driving an autonomous unit. I'm a big believer in that. But um, connecting the dots between here's where we want to go and now go is, um, particularly as your organization scales, is um, it's much harder than it sounds. Mm -hmm. 
because, um, you know, it really, the owners, you know, the onus on us as leaders is being very clear about where we want to go and why. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is, um, that's something that really takes a lot longer than you think, because you really need to think through, okay, what's in my head and how do I articulate that in a way that people can grok and get behind, Mm -hmm. which, you know, is, is, you know, I don't know about you, Roy, but for me personally, it's like, Mm -hmm. I have, a, I have an idea in my head, but I don't always articulate it in the best way, <laughs> you know, where people are like, yes, I get what you're doing. But, um, and then most importantly, I say, okay, great. Now you as leaders, you know, here's kind of generally where we want to go. I need your help to say specifically and tactically how we're going to accomplish that. And you can have that ownership and the autonomy to really power that. But obviously the, the flip side of, of that autonomy is accountability. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think, Roy, when you start to put out, like you said, the key results is really mapping that accountability to those outcomes as well, which is something we've been really working to do. And in fact, we recently reshaped our product roadmap to be an outcome product roadmap. And so we now have, instead of like your your normal feature functionality by quarter, we now have every product and the features and how what the expectation is, and they're kind of grouped by outcomes. And um, that's something that we're using as a forcing function, say, why are we all here and what are we delivering? And how do we work back from that? And it really also is a great forcing function to keep the customer focus in our front and center so we don't get, you know, otherwise as technologists, we kind of get excited about what we're building. Like we're doing this thing and it's on Kubernetes and it's going to be great. <laughs> and we kind of forget that, you know, our customers don't care if it's on Kubernetes to really be honest, they're not, they don't care. They're like, does it solve for, you know, this, does it have this outcome? Does it make it faster? Is it better? Is my experience improved? And so it's a really good way to remind ourselves to, to kind of get out of our own heads and like, okay, what are we, why are we here? And, and I think, Roy, this, this is, you know, this is something we're doing, which is what you articulated, which is mapping back to why am I here as a product leader or as an engineer? Really, really cool, Abby. I think that point around like uh, mapping different pieces of the product to outcomes uh, is, is super interesting. And I'm curious that how does that translate to tackling issues? Because when you're getting issues through Jira and otherwise uh, for, for ind- individual developers and engineers, how are they kind of tying that back to uh, the outcomes in the product? Because over there, it's like, as the issue comes in, you resolve it versus prioritizing the issues based on like what's most important for uh, the product to be more outcomes driven. Um, how has that impacted your issue tackling process internally? Well, we're backing into it now. We just recently started doing this in the last few months. So, yeah, yeah. you know, it's still early days for us, but we're trying to back into that to say, because we're trying to use that also as a forcing function on what are our priorities. Mm-hmm. You know, here at Puppet, we're um, we're at where many of you startups will be in a few years, which is balancing our existing flagship product, Puppet Enterprise, but we're also driving a ton of new innovation. And so for us, we've spent a lot of time trying to help shift priorities towards new innovation, faster sprint cycles, and and really starting to say, okay, let's be real intentional about anything that goes into our existing product because that's mm-hmm. that's time away from other innovation work. And so really that balance. And so we're we're using this as a forcing function to have a lot a lot more intentional conversation before you take that ticket out of the backlog. Why are we working on that and what's the point of it? Super insightful. Uh, I know we can keep talking about talent and, and managing teams for a long time, but I uh, wanted to shift gears um, from, from managing talent and, and man- managing a highly performing team to uh, growing uh, a community and, and powering more like a product-led growth because both of you uh, come from a very unique backgrounds, but both of you have experience like, Abby, you had the background of like building communities and, and understanding open source Really at its close quarters, and and Roy, you're part of an organization that is actually truly product led. Uh, a lot of companies talk about being product led, but this is actually being truly product led. Um, uh, maybe we can uh, start with Roy. Like, how do you? What are the attributes of uh, uh, how the product is is kind of composed that make the adoption faster uh, for something like Calendly? Uh, just so that people who are building products going forward that are more product led. Uh, they can learn from those those composable aspects of of Calendly. Absolutely, 
Um, really, I think to boil it down to the to simplest concepts, I think there's you know two flywheels to really talk about when it comes to to product led growth and uh, and and how we tackle it uh, internally. Um, and and those two flywheels are you know one is kind of internal mm -hmm. uh, to the organization. How mm -hmm. do you how do you bring people to the organization and help them understand what does it mean to to be product led? Mm -hmm. And then there's the, the the clear external flywheel of as people interact with your product, how do you foster that that full experience? Mm -hmm. And you know I think it starts with uh, and they're, they're flywheels that's circular, right? And so it starts with, it starts with onboarding. And so if I talk about internally, what do we do? It is instead of engineer comes in and learns application stack and uh, features and function and stand coding standards, we start with, this is the product. Mm -hmm. These are our users. This is the business. This is how our users leverage our product in order to be successful. Um, and then very similarly in, in onboarding in the external viewpoint, mm -hmm. it is very much how do you quickly get the individual from sign up to value? Mm -hmm. How do you create that, um, that quick education and journey that, that will you know, turn on the light bulb? There's so much under the covers, but how do you really trim it down to this, this seamless experience of I heard about this thing. I signed up and then all of a sudden the light bulb's on, mm -hmm. right? And so that, that's kind of where it starts. And then there's, then there's the engagement aspect of it. Okay, um, I understand these things. And so if I talk about kind of that middle ground of engaging the community, whether mm -hmm. it's the internal employees, then we're talking about persona-driven design. We're talking about having the, the, our engineers actually understand the jobs to be done to be part of the user research that goes on so that they're mm -hmm. still, they're always really focused on our end users. And instead of, you know, we love software as a craft. We want to build the best, uh, most stable, most performant software in the context of how our users need to interact with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then engaging that community externally. Mm -hmm. So how do we do customer advisory boards? Um, do we do some tickets in tandem? We actually have our engineers sit with our customer support, customer experience teams and interact directly with, with our customers as they ask questions mm -hmm. uh, to help us understand what are the, what's the plight uh, and create that conversation. Uh, and then how do you set up in the app during that experience education and contextual feedback so mm -hmm. that there's always the dialogue with the community to kind of keep things front and center. And then then there's the virality aspect of it, right? So you absolutely need to know how, how do other people engage with your existing customers? What are those touch points where um, the light bulb has gone off for the person that's already your customer, mm -hmm. but what are the peripheral touch points of people that aren't yet your customer and how they'll interact with your product? And in, in that spot, for external, you want to make sure there's zero friction for the individual that comes in contact with your application. And then you want to make it e very easy for them to complete that task and to touch that back right around on the full circle with onboarding. Mm -hmm. um, oh, oh, and it's easy enough to sign up and for the light bulb to turn on for the external yeah. user. Uh, and then similarly, internally, really focused on data-driven insights and experimentation. Right? We want to make small tweaks in all of these areas to continue to learn uh, and grow. We, we always think we know. Uh, we've always interacted with our users. We heard they want. Um, but let's make sure that each, each change we make is measured uh, and, and that we continue to learn what works and what doesn't from, from the entire feedback loop. Awesome. Thank you for being uh, describing, describing in such a holistic way, both internal and external, and within that, the, the role of the engineering team to to really understand what the users and product means and stands for and feeding that back in that feedback loop. It's uh, really, really, really helpful to know. Um, Abby, I, I know that like over here, it's we've talked more mostly about like uh, Calendly, which is a consumer product. Uh, and it's more of a prosumer product, I would say. 
uh, where people within organizations and even uh, individual consumers are, are using it. But um, you've been part of like so many open source companies as an advisor, as a practitioner, um, and even with open source frameworks, uh, you do have to make them completely self-serve. People are using it on their machine or their VMs and need to see value as individuals. Um, what are kind of the, uh, is, is everything that, that you, do, you guys do or, or what you've seen uh, aligns with what, what Roy described on the, for a consumer product or are there any diverging opinions that you have because the, the, the audience is, is different? Yeah, well, I think Roy did an amazing job. I actually hope this is recorded. I'm going to send it to some people. <laughs> I wrote an amazing crazy. job of describing <laughs> product-led growth um, and what that that cycle looks like. Because I think it, yeah. it is it is a very big company-wide cycle. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes people forget that it's not just an engineering or a product feedback loop. There's a there's a whole life cycle that's involved in that. I mm -hmm. think. Um, from a pure community and an open source standpoint, it's it's similar but different. It's different in that um, you you have a community of people of practitioners that are responsible for that feedback loop. They're, they're responsible for giving the feedback, but also doing something with that feedback. And it's a it, it's a complicated process that I think a lot of companies that embark on open sourcing something take a, a bit of that for granted which mm -hmm. is, you know, the hope everyone has is I'm going to open source this thing and it's going to go viral. I'm going to have thousands of stars on GitHub. Everyone's going to love it. And people are just going to pile up and try to contribute to it. And it's going to be great. And I'm going to be able to crowdsource R&D. It's going to be magnificent. Um, but the, the flip side of that is one, it very rarely goes viral out of the gate. <laughs> <laughs> Two, um, people do get excited and get engaged but then they tend to like go to the next shiny thing shortly after. Mm -hmm. And three, when people are engaged, they want to work on the exciting stuff. Nobody, it's hard to get people excited about the chopping wood and carrying water parts mm -hmm. of open source, which is, mm -hmm. oh, there's a CVE, oh, there's a bug fix, or we got to update the back end systems. You know, getting people excited about that, everyone's like, oh, why? <laughs> Can I just do the cool stuff that's this new <laughs> API thing? And so, it's really about um, when you think about open sourcing something, you really what I always advise is be very intentional about what you're hoping to get. Mm -hmm. What do you want to get out of it? If mm -hmm. it's community, then you need to spend time. Community mm -hmm. doesn't show up and come up and stay. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to really engage with your community. And, and it isn't actually unlike the product led growth lifecycle that Roy described, which is because a community is going to stay as long as they're getting something out of that. They're looking for that feedback loop as well, be it a more well fleshed out project mm -hmm. or an, an upstream aspect to the commercial product they want to build, or they're mm -hmm. using it in their own product that they're building. Either way, they're looking to, to really have some type of uh, virtuous loop there mm -hmm. with their time and their contribution. And so really respecting that, respecting that a community wants to show up but they're expecting something out of it mm -hmm. and, and treat it as you would a, a customer and mm -hmm. treat it as you would someone that you want to to really participate in the conversation and treat your community that way. And that's it's it's hard to do, though. It's something that takes time. It takes right. effort. And one of the biggest things you have to realize is you have to be comfortable letting go with your vision and your roadmap mm -hmm. for that project. It is now a community driven project, if that's what you want it to be, but you have to really go into it saying, I'm okay with having other people having opinions if they're willing to put in the work to make that happen. And there can be a lot of, of value in that though, because then you can really build community, you build engagement, you build an early access to people that care deeply about your project and eventually mm -hmm. hopefully your product mm -hmm. as you wanna commercialize it and want to be part of that journey with you uh, you get more eyes, you accelerate access to an ecosystem, you you build really quick extensibility and engagement. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of values, but it does, there's a lot of work that has to go into that. And it's, it doesn't come for free. Absolutely. Uh, Abby, your point around like spending time with the community as like customers is is kind of a, a very important point. And I think this kind of gets lost uh, for, for many many startups because when they start open source and then there's pressure to kind of like uh, 
we need to build an enterprise version, whether it's like T for teams or for the entire organization and like, what should that product look like? And at that early stage, you have limited resources. W what are your thoughts on how to manage either should you up to like few milestones, should you just focus on getting more ubiquity of adoption and improving your features for your community because they are your customers and they take time uh, and you should give them time. And, or on the other hand, like, are you you're splitting your time between like building those enterprise features and doing like a basic job for your community? And I think you don't achieve either of the worlds really well. Uh, what, have, what have you seen uh, in your experience? And what, what are your thoughts? It depends. My answer mm -hmm. is it depends because it depends on, like I said, what do you want to get out of it? Like, yeah. Um, for example, if you're an early stage startup and you're opening, you're open sourcing something because you want to get early engagement and get and get feedback, that's great. But you have to often recognize, depending on the project you're you're creating, you have to recognize that those early users may not ever be customers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They and so the feedback you get, the feedback you pull back into the product development and those pull requests you take may or may not further your your actual vision towards that persona that you're actually targeting as a customer. Mm -hmm. And your users and customers may be very different. Mm -hmm. And so that's something you really have to understand. It yeah. depends on your product. But for many open source products, the open source users are very different from the commercial Yep. customers absolutely they're not the same people they're not solving the same problems mm -hmm. um, for some uh, particularly some of the smaller um, very technical open source projects some people are running them at home they're running them solving their own clusters at home like mm -hmm. um, I have a startup that I advise and I invest in and a lot of his early users around kubernetes clusters were at home users and I'm mm -hmm. like and my advice was be careful as you think about shaping your roadmap because their expectations and their their needs for their at home cluster is going to be different from someone that's maybe got 30 clusters and an engineering team of 30 people mm -hmm. and or as you scale and try to target the enterprise you know then a team of thousands that have mm -hmm. thousands of clusters and i think just recognizing where that feedback sits in your expectations for the future growth of your product mm -hmm. and is that a community and a user or is that a customer and how do you want to prioritize those things and when you're early stage and you've got a small team mm -hmm. you're going to have to be really judicious with that because right you can get too sucked down a path that doesn't lead you to to the revenue targets that you really need to hit early on right right super helpful um if i look at like startups across the spectrum these days whether it's like a developer focused company or a, a prosumer focused company everyone is trying to build communities for different aspirations obviously some of them are trying to build for the user and and those kind of users and that cohort of users and that creates a community some people are not feel that the market is not there yet and they are trying to educate people and also trying to address their questions and that leads to like a community as well and there are different aspirations for different communities but everyone is trying to build it in some way or form uh, what are your thoughts on like the the cold start problem over here? Like, how do you how do you start like building something as a community? And firstly, before I even ask that question, is it useful in your opinion? Uh, and it was, what is it useful for? And then how do you actually solve the cold cold start problem? I know there are a couple of questions embedded in this, uh, but uh, maybe we can start with Roy, uh, given that Calendly is a prosumer product, and and you might have. Uh, maybe a different answer than Abby, but uh, maybe my kind of completely aligns. Oh, I am so dying to hear Abby's answer on this one. Um, I, I think in a, you know, uh, I ride coattails of brilliant entrepreneurs and, and build the systems that, that they envision, <laughs> right? And so uh, maybe I'm not qualified to answer this one. I, I will say, you know, um, from Tope and, and hearing him talk uh, about why it's really starts with solving a, a real world frustration um, and, uh, you know, and being able to articulate what that frustration was and, and, um, and being able to put it in, in, you know, a small group of people's hands that, that you already know, uh, you know, s solves a real world problem for them. And then you generate momentum from there. And it's, it's a ton of, 
of sweat equity and and going back and and you know cultivating those relationships from from the ground up and you know specifically in, in Calendly's journey you know that was that was four or five years of just organic growth and word of mouth and and continuing to kind of cultivate what uh, what that community needed uh, mm -hmm. over time. Uh, so it was definitely a, a it's a journey. Uh, and there, you know, uh, uh, there's not a magic uh, recipe to, to that, except for you know being willing to engage broadly and and continue to have those conversations and um, you know and and solving that real world problem. Super helpful, uh, Abby. What are your thoughts? I mean, it's a grind either way. Even in yep. open source, I, I think if you want to start with open source and you want that, like, we're going to start, we're going to build something together as a community, you have to start with what are we doing and why? Mm -hmm. And you're not going to get people to join if there's not a clarity on those two, mm -hmm. two, two points. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, it's time. Yeah. And there is no, I do want to really exclamation point behind what Roy says is you got to, there's a lot of sweat equity. This is like, there's no, I know so many companies that look at you, particularly if you're looking at open source, they look at these open source projects and they're like, yeah, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. It's going to be amazing. And it's going to just rock it out of the gate. And they don't recognize that they're the team of people behind the scenes that are grinding it out, that are building the work, that are getting people engaged, that are working on, the the feature functionality that are working on the proposals and the docs and like building the momentum and it's uh it's something that takes a long time and it takes a long time to build the momentum and the engagement and then it takes you know and that's just to get something out the door that's to get that alpha out and then even even in open source and then that's where the real work has to start because then you have to get feedback and iterate and iterate and iterate some more and you know I'll use Kubernetes because a lot of people see Kubernetes like, okay, well, I want to, I want to really replicate that, that meteoric rise that Kubernetes had. And, you know, Kubernetes is over seven years old now. And it's, <laughs> and it had a lot of, a lot of, a lot of blessings coming out of the gate with, you know, the Google halo mm -hmm. and a lot of money uh, backing it behind the scenes to really turn that into both a, a fully formed product, but then an open source product project. And I think, I just want to reiterate, there's a lot of grinding that has to happen to get something to the point that it takes off. And you've got to really nail, what are we doing? Why, why does it matter? What's the impact going to be? If it's just a project, then what? We get this project out the door, then what happens? And I think it's, it seems super basic, but I got to be honest, that's actually the hard part is yeah. really getting clarity on that. Super helpful. I, I, there have been so many brilliant nuggets in, in this conversation around both product-led growth and building a community, understanding open source. Uh, we should like send it to all the uh, founders in our network. Uh, I'm glad this is getting recorded. Uh, but before we run out of time, I have one question um, uh, in, in the comments uh, section. Uh, this is, Roy, this is for you. If you can get a hint of... Uh, what product features are coming next to Calendly? Um, Chris Kirsten wants to know. Oh, uh, we are we have so much on our roadmap. It's um it's 2022 is shaping up to be so exciting. Um, if you if you didn't see it, uh, polls just went beta for us, uh, which is um, basically allowing people to vote on the most convenient time to get together uh, and meet. Um, so it's just in beta. Uh, the, the evolution of polls will be outstanding to watch. We'll continue to open up our platform and uh, add additional integrations and capabilities to it over the course of, of 2022. And uh, yeah, please uh, follow along. Uh, lots of lots of great stuff coming. As a customer, I'm mm -hmm. real excited about polls. So Same. <laughs> I'm real excited about it. So. Really looking forward to that. Um, uh, Abby, I have the same question for you as well. On on the puppet side, like, what are you seeing as kind of the the next phase um, on on the product roadmap? I mean, we're just focused on simplifying, simplifying, simplifying the automation work. I mean, everyone cares about infrastructure automation; it's super important, but it's also a massive pain in the ass. So, how do we take something that's complicated around complex systems and make it dirt simple? And that's right. 
that's largely the journey we're on is how do we simplify the experience right right well uh, i know i'd love to like talking with both of you like i'd love to keep talking with both of you like for hours but uh, i know we have to we have to call it a day today but uh, thank you so much for for joining and for your like raw candid thoughts um uh, i'm sure like founders have learned a lot and I'm glad we've had this session recorded um really thankful to both of you for joining thank you for having me yeah thank you thanks roy thanks abby thank right. you